When I talk about any electrical appliance which replaces a combustion appliance, critics always like to say that, well, your electricity is coming from coal, so therefore the climate impact is actually worse. But the reality is that this criticism is wrong in at least two ways. First, and as a simple matter of fact, nobody's electricity is coming exclusively from coal. Almost every grid in the world has some wind and solar mixed into it, as well as hydro, nuclear and gas. But even more important is the fact that the omnipresence of wind and solar is not by accident. The fact is that utility scale wind and solar generate profits when deployed to replace conventional electricity. And while it's true that we can't have 100% wind and solar with current technologies, the point of maximum profitability is still fairly high, somewhere around 40 to 45% wind and solar. So to be clear, I'm talking about the point of maximum profitability for the companies which supply our grid electricity. And this is important because even if your grid is not there right now, the profits mean that capitalism alone should be enough to get it there eventually. And this means that for the sake of climate change, you as the individual really don't have to worry about where the electricity is coming from. You only have to electrify. Now in this video I want to explain why this is the case and help you understand where the 40% figure is coming from and how come it's so high. So that once you understand this you can have confidence in the inevitability of wind and solar. So hello YouTube, I'm Michael Size and the LCOE or the levelized cost of energy is a measure for the all-in cost for the energy that you get from something and by this measure wind and solar are the cheapest sources of energy in human history. Now critics of wind and solar absolutely hate this way of measuring their cost and they do have a point. The LCOE includes the cost to build out the facility, the cost to operate it and the marginal cost of power production as well. But if I have a coal power plant and a solar farm next to it, it really doesn't matter how big I make the solar farm, it will still never produce electricity at night and that means that I still have to build the coal plant alongside the solar so I'm still paying the part of the coal plant's LCOE which is derived from the upfront cost and I also have to keep it staffed and operational and that takes money as well. Of course you save the coal while the sun is shining so the annual fuel bill goes down but the rest of the costs remain unchanged. So the reality is that it is insufficient for wind and solar to beat thermal power plants on an LCOE basis but rather the LCOE of wind and solar needs to single-handedly beat just the fuel cost of combustion power plants. So the all-in cost of wind and solar needs to beat the marginal cost of the combustion power plants and thankfully it already does but there is still one more problem the LCOE is calculated based on the amount of energy which is produced but to make a profit it's obviously not enough to produce the energy you also have to sell it to someone and get paid for it and that means that you need instantaneous demand for combustion power plants this is a non-issue they simply throttle up and down to match the demand but for wind and solar they're going to produce electricity on their own schedule and if you don't have the demand on the grid to match that schedule, you're gonna have to throw away some of the energy and that's called curtailment. If you end up curtailing too much of your wind and solar, then the profits can quickly evaporate. And this means that we have two competing mechanisms to balance. As you build more wind and solar, you save more fuel, which makes your profits go up. But at the same time, as you build more wind and solar, you're making it more likely for curtailment to occur, which actually makes your profits go down. This means that the point of maximum profitability is actually the point where these two effects are perfectly balanced, so how do we find that point? In short, we find it by performing a simulation, where we backtest all possible configurations of wind and solar for a certain interconnection against real historical demand and production data. And then we simply select the highest value in the output matrix. But once again, I want you to have confidence in the inevitability of wind and solar, and that means that I want you to understand how this simulation is actually built, so that you can have confidence in the output. And 
and to do that I'll make use of a series of increasingly complex charts starting with this one. This is a stacked area chart which shows a hypothetical imaginary electrical grid over a 24 hour period. The horizontal axis is time and the vertical axis is power, while the area on the chart shows which source of electricity is fulfilling the demand. In this very first chart everything is being served by coal. Now if we add a small amount of solar to the mix, now you can probably start to see how this chart actually works. The demand remains the same at a constant 10 gigawatts, but now part of it is being fulfilled by solar and this means that the coal power plants are throttling down for some hours of the day and this saves fuel. If we were to add even more solar, it would save even more fuel, but there is a limit to this. And in practice, the limit is actually the depth to which the coal plants can throttle. So if that's around 10% of maximum power, or in this case 1 gigawatt, that means that if we want to have zero curtailment, then we can only size our solar panels such that their highest instantaneous production on the sunniest possible day does not not exceed 9 gigawatts and that looks something like this. At this point on a yearly basis our electricity mix would consist of just above 15% solar and 85% coal, but in practice we can actually go higher. In reality electricity demand is higher during the day so the demand curve would actually look a lot more like this. You can see that the maximum daily demand actually coincides fairly well with the maximum solar production. So this means that we can push the solar deployment just a little bit higher which would look like this and that would put our yearly production at almost 20% solar. Now the past two charts have been representations of the sunniest day of the year so the average day might look a lot more like this. That is a lot of coal and that gives us space to deploy some wind energy alongside the solar on this same grid. Now at this point this imaginary grid chart actually becomes very broken and it's not at all representative of real grids. But this is the real basic idea behind how we can get 40% solar and wind on the same grid in practice. But to see how that's actually done it's time to move on to charts built using real historical data. The reason we have to do this is because any imaginary chart is going to fail to capture the true volatility of actual grids and that means not only the volatility of wind and solar production but also the volatility of demand because a real grid looks a lot more like this. The configuration of this chart is the same as before, stacked area chart, power on the vertical, time on the horizontal, hourly data, colors are the same but the values are not imaginary anymore. The values are based on real historical data from Czechia. The demand values are real and unmodified while the renewables production figures are real curves but amplified values and the call here just fills the gap to meet the demand. To be clear this is not Czechia's grid, it's still a simulation but it uses real historical data from a real grid and I picked Czechia mostly because it's just in the middle of Europe. So first I want you to notice the demand here, it's higher during the day as we've already covered but it's also noticeably lower during the weekends and it actually varies from week to week as well. On a one year chart you can also see the seasonal variation with demand being higher in the winter and on a full 8 year chart you can even notice the holiday season. But back to the small chart and looking at production now, notice how incredibly volatile wind actually is. Now on average it is true that the wind blows harder at night and harder in the winter, but on a granular level wind is actually all over the place in a way that's fundamentally more volatile than solar. Solar certainly can suffer from clouds and snow cover, but it still has the advantage that for every single minute of the year you can reliably predict whether it's gonna be nighttime or daytime, and if it's daytime you can also predict the exact position at which the sun will be in the sky and you can even predict solar eclipses. 
With wind, you get absolutely no guarantees. So as I said, it's all of this volatility that makes it such that imaginary charts don't cut it at this level. So we simulate on real data instead. So here's how my simulation actually works. For the data, we have three columns with historical values for every hour between 2015 and 2022 inclusively, which shows the power production of wind, the power production of solar, as well as the demand that it hour. We know that the installed powers that achieved these values were 339 megawatts for wind and 2050 megawatts for solar. So if we want to know what would have happened if there was say 500 megawatts of wind and a thousand megawatts of solar, we just need to multiply the production by the correct factors and that's what we call amplifying the values. So the simulation first chooses an installed power value for wind and one for solar. It then goes through the whole data set, amplifies the production values to match the power values that it had picked earlier. And for every hour, it checks whether the production of wind and solar exceeds demand. And if it doesn't, it calculates how much more coal is necessary in order to satisfy the demand. And it does this while keeping in mind to not throttle the coal plants below 10%. So at this point we know how much coal would have been burned, how much wind and solar energy would have been produced, as well as how much wind and solar energy would have been accepted. But we actually only need the first two values. Because we're using the LCOE for wind and solar, we actually just need to multiply the LCOE by the gross production value and not by the accepted production. And that will give us the cost of running the wind and solar for this particular period. Meanwhile, for the coal, we don't need to worry about its fixed costs because that will get cancelled out in the final subtraction anyway. We only need to worry about the cost of the coal that has been actually burned. So we can add these two together for the scenario that we just simulated and subtract the total cost from the value that the grid would have cost if we were running everything on coal. And that gives us the savings or the losses associated associated with mixing in this amount of wind and solar. The values used for this calculation are $30 per megawatt hour as the LCOE of both wind and solar and $40 per megawatt hour as the fuel cost of coal power plants. And this simulation is being run for every combination of wind and solar between 0.5 and 20 gigawatts of installed power of each split in 0.5 gigawatt increments. Increments. So that gives us a two-dimensional array of simulation results and all we need to do now is select the highest value in the table. And that tells us the amount of installed wind power and solar power at which the profits would have been maximized. So for this particular grid we find the maximum profits at 10.5 gigawatts of wind and 8 gigawatts of solar. And then we can build a whole second simulation which takes in those values, runs on the same data set with the same rules and just reports back the share of accepted energy that was wind and solar as well as the percentage of curtailment and just to cross check I made this simulation calculate the savings as well and indeed both simulations get the same number. So this is how we get over 40% wind and solar with less than 5% curtailment with no storage whatsoever and while saving almost $2 billion compared to running all coal. Czechia is just an example, but it's not an outlier, and you'd get similar results for most countries. This is where my 40-50% to figure comes from, and this is why I'm so confident in it. But the final step in solidifying our confidence is actually a reality check against actual grids, because deployment is actually quite far along already. Countries such as the UK, the Netherlands, Spain, Germany and Greece are all at right around 35% wind and solar, so not far at all. Denmark is at 60%, but it has a few advantages that are not easily replicated for other countries. California and Texas are both at around 30%, and the, the, the very middle of the United States is at 40% wind, and so far this has been achieved almost entirely without battery storage. 
and just as a side note it will actually be batteries which will allow the rest of the world to profitably reach the 60 to 70 percent point which Denmark has already achieved. But before I end this video I actually want to circle all the way back to the original complaint once more. I said that it was wrong in at least two ways and depending on how you count it could actually be three because the criticism is based on the idea that if your electricity is coming from only coal then for the sake of the climate it does not make sense to electrify but that's actually false as well. If you actually do the calculations you'll see that the emissions associated with an electric vehicle are still lower than those associated with a combustion vehicle even when running on all coal and just the same the emissions associated with a heat pump are also lower than those associated with a gas boiler even when the heat pump is running on all coal. Both of these are thanks to the incredibly high efficiency of the electric options or conversely the incredibly low efficiency of the combustion variants but there is actually one minor example where this doesn't hold and it annoys me so much that it's actually the reason why I decided to make this video and that example is induction cooking. Now I recommend cooking on induction anyway just for the health benefits but cooking on induction using electricity made entirely from coal is in fact worse for the climate than cooking on gas. Now the break-even point is actually around 40% wind and solar but as we've discussed 40% wind and solar is actually inevitable given enough time so there you go. Electrification remains always good. By which I mean that it remains always good for the climate but not only for the climate. Because electrification is also good for a whole lot more stuff and if you're looking for something to watch next I have a video all about the various reasons to electrify. Thank you for watching, like and subscribe.